Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to moderate uh, this panel on the 50th anniversary of the South Royalton Conference. Uh, I'm Peter Klein. I'm a professor at Baylor University and was not present at the South Royalton Conference, though I was alive at that time, but I was not deeply into Austrian economics as I was you know, drooling over my, my baby food. But uh, we're so privileged to have five uh, distinguished panelists all of whom were present at the 1974 conference. And to repeat a remark that one of them just made, you know, I hope by the end of this, uh, this session, we'll still have five fully functioning <laughs> <laughs> panelists. <laughs> uh, one, one announcement before we get started uh, is, and I think, Joe, you asked me to remind everyone that uh, for all participants at the conference this weekend, we welcome your submissions to the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics or the Journal of Libertarian Studies. Um, you can talk to uh, Joe, the academic vice president, uh, Timothy Terrell with the QJAE, uh, or any of the staff or, or senior faculty for advice in uh, how to position your paper or anything about uh, those uh, procedures. But we would love to see the, the papers presented here eventually make their way uh, into publication. So uh, June of 1974 was a remarkable event held at a small town in, uh, uh, in Vermont. And uh, uh, there's, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at some of the materials that are downstairs in the, uh, sorry, in New Hampshire. I said Vermont, New Hampshire. Yeah, Vermont. It was Vermont, yeah. Vermont, yeah. Uh, uh, the, yeah, okay, well, I'm done. <laughs> I had some notes, but I'm so worried about their well-being that I, I get nervous. Let's get nervous, yeah, it's true. Uh, but we have, so I should have been an economic geographer like Professor Sabrin. I think you all know these five uh, gentlemen. They really don't need any introduction, but very briefly, we have Walter Block, who is the uh, Harold E. Wirth eminent scholar at Loyola University, New Orleans. Jack High, who is Professor Emeritus at George Mason University. Randy Holcomb, who is the DeVoe Moore Professor at Florida State University in the Economics Department. Murray Sabrin, who you heard already, is uh, Professor Emeritus at Ramapo College in New Jersey. And Joe Salerno, Professor Emeritus at Pace University in New York and Academic Vice President of the Mises Institute. So quite a few professors emeriti. Uh, but if you do the math and you think about how old someone would have to be to attend an academic conference in 1974, that shouldn't come as too big a surprise. Um, you know, I, I think it is widely acknowledged within the Austrian community that the South Royalton Conference uh, in 1974, you know, if not the substantive beginning of the modern Austrian school or the Austrian revival, was at least a very important institutional beginning of the school. And I think it's hard for most of us in our you know, modern uh, high-tech networked age uh, to remember uh, that you know, in the 1950s, 60s, early 70s, you had a few Austrian economists, you know, Mises, of course, Hayek, uh, a few others, uh, the students of Mises and Hayek, a few others scattered around the world, but there was very little ability to communicate. People didn't know each other. Uh, they hadn't met in person, and the sort of uh, social networking and institution building aspects of an intellectual movement, something that we often take for granted today in the digital age, uh, th th you know, that was a much bigger challenge to the, the rebirth of the Austrian tradition at that time. And so um, a group of individuals, we'll get into some of the details, um, uh, 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 centered at the Institute for Humane Studies, had the idea to put this uh, to put this conference together. And there were actually a series of conferences. There were three, or really four. There was the South Royalton Conference in '74. There was a follow-up conference in Hartford, Connecticut, '75. There was a conference at Windsor Castle in 1976, and then a fourth conference at the University of Delaware. I think also later in 1976. Those were the you know first sort of Austrian conferences to be held in the United States uh, in the 20th century. And as you remember, um, you know, the Austrian school was sort of at a low point in the 60s and 70s. You had Rothbard, Kirzner, a few others uh, writing some very important works. But as a, as a whole, the Austrian school was, was regarded as sort of a historical footnote. Remember that the, 
uh, June of 1974 was before Hayek's Nobel Prize, which was later that year in 1974. So if, the, if Hayek's Nobel Prize sort of reignited interest in the Austrian school, uh, you know, at a larger level, among those uh, sort of, uh, you know, insiders in the Austrian movement, the revival actually begun earlier uh, that same year. So, uh, you know, I, I've asked the panelists to participate in a sort of unstructured, free-flowing, fireside chat kind of atmosphere. So they're not going to make any prepared, no speeches, thank goodness. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out some questions and let them reflect, or respond and reflect and, and maybe reflect on each other's comments. And then we'll have plenty of time at the end. Uh, I think we go until four uh, for questions from the audience. Okay, so once again, everybody, thank you for being here. Let me start by asking some of you uh, a little bit more about how you, how you heard about this conference. How did you come to be invited to it? And what did you think when you got a letter or a phone call or someone saying, come to a small town uh, uh, in Vermont for a, a conference on Austrian economics? Uh, Walter, let me begin with you. So going age, not beauty. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mental acuity. <laughs> Hello. Um, before I answer that question, I just wanted to uh, mention something uh, that, that was previously mentioned as to why did we have this revival given that Hayek didn't win his Nobel Prize until afterward? And Joe Salerno wrote a beautiful paper on this saying why it was and his reason, correct me if I'm wrong, was the 1962 publication of Man, Economy, and State. That's why we were there. That's, uh, uh, so it wasn't Hayek because, uh, Hayek's Nobel Prize, which came later. It was because of uh, Man, Economy, and State by Murray Rothbard. So who uh, invited you to the conference, and well, how did they get your name? Uh, I was, um, I don't know, a fan of Murray Rothbard. Um, I, uh, I I started in with the libertarian movement through the Ayn Rand situation. I uh, she came to Brooklyn College to lecture, and I came to boo and hiss her, be, not to cancel her. We didn't cancel in those days. We just polite booing, and <laughs> and. Um, um, Brandon was very nice to me. He had a little debate with me, and uh, he recommended um, um, Atlas Shrugged and Economics in One Lesson. And then I, uh, my next stage in development was I was at um, uh, Columbia University with Larry Moss. And Larry Moss says, you must meet this guy, Murray Rothbard. He's an anarchist. And I said, I don't want to meet an anarchist, because I was a Randian. <laughs> and, uh, so I uh, put it off. But finally, I met Murray. And um, uh, this was in 1966, maybe, or maybe 65, I'm not sure. So I was um, a member of the living room crowd. I sometimes think of the Mises Institute as Murray Rothbard's living room writ large. So I was a fan of Murray Rothbard's, and um, I uh, uh, attended uh, the uh, living room sessions where we play Risk and stuff like that. And I was a, um, a fan of Murray Rothbard, and... That's how I got invited. Uh, so uh, Joe and Murray, you both also knew Murray Rothbard personally. Prior to 1974, you had interacted with him. And presumably your connection to the organizers of this event, the way you got on the radar screen, was maybe a recommendation from Murray Rothbard or someone else who was close to IHS. Is that correct? Actually, I met, as I mentioned this morning, I, um, I read Man, Economy, and State uh, in February of 1974 while I was... Um, bogged down with pneumonia, thanks to Nixon's uh, uh, horrific oil policy, trying to get gasoline and commuting to Rutgers uh, four times a week. And so I read Man, Economy, and State. I, re I wrote Murray a, a letter, didn't hear from him, and then I went to Brooklyn Polytech to meet him and to invite him to be on my dissertation committee. And um, a few days later, a week or so later, I get a letter from Ed Dolan inviting me to the conference. And to me, this was like... The, an incredible invitation to meet uh, young economists and uh, listen to uh, Austrian School economists lecture on uh, topics that I was just learning about. And so uh, I met Joe there. We roomed together. And um, uh, that was me. Uh, <laughs> we both had a lot more hair, according to the pictures there. 
Uh, and so, and, so you were both PhD students at that time? Yes. And, the th okay, and Walter, you were already, you had finished your PhD by that time. And, and I think you invited Rothbard to speak at Rutgers in that February. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I missed that because I was sick. So That's here right, you yeah. go. Yeah, so just, I, just briefly, not your yeah, whole history, not, not, yeah. School. So I was the vice president of, of the New Jersey Libertarian Party, and I was in charge of getting a speaker for our first convention, and this was the year before um, South Royalton, and so I, I, I got up the courage and I called up Murray Rothbard, who lived right across the river, and he, and he, he agreed to come over for seventy-five dollars um, and, and a, a bad chicken dinner, and but when he found out I was a graduate student, to make a long story short, he, he was very excited. He's trying to. Look at ah, where's my pen? <laughs> and and so he he put he wrote my number down and he said I'll have somebody call you or um to, to join a, a a book club a book a reading circle, and um and Walter happened to be there and uh, and that Monday someone called me because the event was on a weekend and then after that I I began talking to him once in a while on the phone and then that following summer um I was invited to his living room. Almost alone, just with one other person, and in which he asked me, a lot, I was very nervous. But as soon as he came to the door, he was just very friendly and welcoming, like he had known me for you know ten years. And he said, "Oh, Joe, my boy, welcome." <laughs> and and so I went in, and, and from there I, I became friendly with him, and, and I got my invitation from Ed Dolan uh, at Murray's recommendation. Yeah. So, but partly what I'm trying to figure out among the panelists, yeah. some of you were sort of part of, or would soon be part of the Murray Rothbard living room crowd, and Murray Rothbard was regarded by Ed Dolan, who was the organizer of the event. By the way, the reason it was in uh, South Royalton, Vermont, is because Ed Dolan was a professor at Dartmouth in New Hampshire, which is what confused me earlier, and South Royalton was, was quite close to his headquarters uh, uh, at Dartmouth. But uh, Randy and Jack, how, so you guys were not part of the Rothbard circle. You were not in the New York area, either one of you. Do you recall how you first got connected with IHS or with the people who organized that conference? How did you come to be at an event of young Austrians? Randy and then Jack. So um, I, to, uh, I was an undergraduate at the University of Florida, economics major, never heard of the Austrian school. I mean, that just wasn't this kind of stuff that was taught. When I got to graduate school, uh, at Virginia Tech uh, at the time. Um, I think so, my professors, a lot of them were sympathetic with Austrian ideas, but it wasn't in the classes. Actually, I credit Jack, uh, who was a classmate of mine, first year in graduate school, very familiar with the Austrian schools, like gave me a reading list. And so I've, uh, I've, I've read Rothbard and uh, Kersner's Competition Entrepreneurship had no, I guess that came out the next year. No, oh, yeah, but, but, but yeah, so, so I had read that and, and, and some Mises and stuff, so I'm familiar with the Austrian ideas. Uh, and we had there a group of us, graduate students, who we talk about that stuff and basically, you know, had to, had to read it, had to be familiar with it. Um, uh, and uh, so the way I found out about the conference was a uh, faculty member, Richard Wagner at Virginia Tech, said, there's this uh, conference going up, you might, uh, going on. You might be interested in it. You might want to apply. I applied. I got accepted. So that's my story. There was an application. I, I you sent could apply. in. Yeah, okay. I just oh, sent I in an application. Uh, yeah. I'd never met Murray or wow. Israel or anybody before. I just sent in an application. Was accepted. And Jack, what about you? Well, while while these guys uh, were in New York and New Jersey, I was wandering around in the desert. I uh, got my undergraduate degree in economics from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. There wasn't an Austrian within a thousand miles. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had learned about Austrian economics through Rand. And in fact, I have studied economics because I read this book called uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, from there, I found my way to Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, and I thought, gee, what a great discipline this is. I think I'll try this. So I enrolled in uh, economics at the University of Utah and spent you know, three years uh, never meeting, never learning anything about Austrian economics. But I was interested. I, you know, I read what I could. I went to Virginia Tech. I met Randy, John Metcalf. There were a number of us students who were interested and were 
self-taught. And uh, I went to Virginia Tech for one year. It was a very depressing experience for me. Randy and John aside, Blacksburg is not much of a metropolis. <laughs> and uh, so I, I had quit and was, was in L.A. And either Randy or John Metcalf, one of my fellow students, told me about South Royalton. So I wrote a uh, letter to IHS and I asked if I could attend the conference and they, they uh, what really thrilled me is they paid my way. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific, thank you. Yeah. Actually, my, my, my own introduction to the Austrian school was also from reading Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and checking, chasing down the references in the back. Yeah. Um, so for some of you, was this your first academic conference of any kind? Had you been to the American Economic Association or the Southern Economic Association or some similar event? Did you know what an academic conference was? No. <laughs> I had not been to any other economic. OK. so so. Uh, I'm wondering about kind of expectations going in. So some of you already knew Murray Rothbard, uh, but maybe you didn't know Israel Kirshner. I'm guessing you probably didn't know about Ludwig Lachmann. So the three primary lecturers were Rothbard, Kirshner, and Lachmann. Um, so when you got the program and you saw the speakers and the readings, what did you think? Were you excited? Do you think, did you think this is going to be a transformational event? Or were you puzzled and confused by who some of the speakers were? Oh, no, I mean, I'll, I'll speak to that because um, uh, I had read Kirzner's work and Rothbard's work. And so, I, was, well, I mean, one of the attractions to me was I get to meet these guys. You know, I've read, read their work. I get to meet them. And uh, so I didn't know. I mean, I only knew about them through their work. And having read, in particular, having read Murray's stuff, you know, I'm thinking, it's probably some bitter old man here, you know. <laughs> so, so, and uh, so, you know, so I show up in South Royalton, and and Murray's there, and it's like almost the opposite of what I expected. I mean, it's like Santa Claus. He's like this fat, jolly guy. He's telling jokes and stories and everything. I mean, it's so delightful. And uh, if you knew Murray, I mean, he he had this magnetic personality. I mean, if he came in the room, people would flock around him. He was a great storyteller. He was so entertaining. Uh, and so, I mean, what, I, I was expecting to meet those guys. I knew who was on the program, expecting to meet him. And it was a pleasant surprise, actually for all of them, but it was a pleasant surprise to meet Murray. And of course, Israel Kirsner, such a gentleman, such a great individual. I mean, so, so, uh, I didn't know exactly what to expect having met him, but what a, that, that's one of the attractions was actually getting to meet those guys after reading their work. The same for others, too? You were excited to get to meet in person folks that you'd read about or heard about? Well, uh, the person that I really was interested in meeting was Henry Hazlitt, because I'd read Economics in One Lesson earlier that year. Uh, so Economics in One Lesson to me was an epiphany. I said, how could anybody not agree with what's written here because it's so clear, it's concise, it's logical. And he challenged every uh, status premise there was in economic policy. And meeting him at age 80 was unbelievable because he was vibrant, he was standing tall, um, and it was just a, a great joy to meet him because uh, at that time, uh, I had been reading uh, his column that was divided into three economists, Milton Friedman being one of them who attended. We'll talk about him later. Um, but meeting Hazlitt, to me, was, um, I think, just as important as meeting the other economists, even more so because Hazlitt was the quintessential public intellectual. He took very difficult concepts and presented to the public that even Joe Biden could understand. <laughs> and... Um, that's not that's not easy to do because um, Joe doesn't know it. Joe doesn't know it. But um, uh, to me, meeting Hazlitt, I think, was uh, a, a, a great experience because um, he said something to me, which I'll we'll talk about later, which I think was quite interesting. Okay. I'm glad you mentioned Hazlitt. He was present at the opening dinner as sort of an honored guest, although he was not one of the speakers at the second two days of the conference. Um, w w others, uh, had you... Like Walter, had you met Kirzner and Lachman prior to the conference, or no? Uh, I have to brag in two ways. First of all, I might be the only person in the room who actually shook the hand of Ludwig von Mises. I never washed the hand since. <laughs> 
it's a little dirty, but if you shake my hand, you channel Mises. Uh, the other way I'd like to brag is that I, along with Walter Grinder, I think to a great degree was responsible for Ludwig Lachmann being there. Uh, Walter Grinder, my mentor, when I was in Murray's living room, Walter sort of took me aside and um, took me under his arm because Murray was busy with a lot of people, but Walter Grinder was sort of my assistant mentor. And he and I were bugging the hell out of Israel Kirzner. And finally, Israel threw up his arms in dismay and said, well, what do you want me to do? And what we suggested was that he invite Ludwig von uh, Ludwig Lachmann to be a visiting professor at NYU, which was why uh, Ludwig was there. So I, I was knowledgeable about all three. Uh, I bugged the hell out of Israel along with Walter Grinder, uh, uh, sort of re semi responsible for uh, Ludwig being there, and certainly I knew Murray beforehand. Okay, thank you, Joe. Yeah, um, one of the people that I was very impressed with, and, and I don't think I knew that this uh, person would be there. To, uh, a great British economist um, and a, a, a great gentleman, uh, William H. Hutt, who was sort of the leading anti-Keynesian of the post-war period, even more than Henry Hazlitt. He, he detested Keynes. But uh, so uh, Richard Ebling and myself, Richard Ebling cannot be here, he had an illness in a family. But um, we were sitting at a table with um, W.H. Hutt, and you know, I had read some of his uh, his works before, and so had Richard Ebling. So we were very excited to meet him because we didn't know he was going to be there. But when Ludwig Lachmann came in, he said, what is he doing there, here? And I, I, we said, well, you know, he's, he's an Austrian. He says, no, he isn't. He's a Keynesian. So, so everybody was <laughs> <laughs> his greatest curse. But um, I, I highly recommend reading um, some of Hutt's works, and he, he did contribute a lot to the conference. I, wonder, I was going to come back later to this comment by Hutt about Luckman on kind of the, I was going to come to it later, but let's go there now, some of the kind of uh, variety of opinions among the participants, both the, the keynote speakers and the other distinguished panelists and even some of the junior folks. In particular, as most of you know, if you've read any of the accounts of this period, uh, Milton Friedman was sort of an I don't know, an uninvited guest, or I guess he was sort of invited by Ed Dolan, but Friedman, you know, was not a participant in the conference, but because he had a summer house nearby, he was somehow invited to drop in, I guess on the Friday, maybe at the opening dinner, and he made a few impromptu remarks that did not go over completely well, at least according to the, the reminiscences that have been published, including, you know, famously saying, there's no such thing as Austrian economics, only good economics and bad economics, of course, he did seem to think there was such a thing as Chicago economics. <laughs> but I, I, so what I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, you were younger, younger, uh, impressionable young lads at that time. I mean, when Milton Friedman showed up, obviously you knew who he was. Did you know that there was some friction between Friedman and the Austrians? And what did you think of Friedman being there? Can I, let me just give you the background on that. Murray Rothbard had just published an article in his libertarian forum entitled Uncle Milty Rides Again, in which he called Friedman because Friedman wanted an index scheme. He said, well, inflation, we can neutralize inflation. Even if there's inflation, if we can index people's incomes um, and contracts, there wouldn't be any problem. So Rothbard called this called Friedman a monetary crank and an inflationist. Okay. So when Friedman showed up, we, we had all read this. We all, you know, read Rothbard. And we, many of us went over to Friedman and asked him what, what, he, what he thought. And he was very upset. And then, so he would say a few things about Rothbard. Then we'd go across the room to, to, to Rothbard and tell him what. And that went on for a, a good 20, 30 minutes. Anybody else have memories of that? Yeah. Um, as I recall, uh, Friedman made some remarks about Mises at the Mount Pelerin Society. And I don't know, and he, um, he, he I guess he, he, he told the story. Yeah, he told the story about, about that. About me. Go ahead. Yeah, he, he, he um, <laughs> Friedman Fox told. Joe Salano show. I, no. <laughs> well, it is my show. <laughs> <laughs> Friedman, Friedman told uh, the story about Mises um, being on, uh, I guess, on the, on the boat over to uh, um, the Mont Pelerin, first Mont Pelerin Society meeting, or, or there at, in one of the meeting rooms, in which they were discussing withholding tax, which Milton Friedman had implemented, or had, had formulated, um, during World War II, while he was working for the Treasury Department. And um, 
so they were talking about, you know, progressive versus other types of taxes and, uh, you know, how the income tax was necessary, but maybe the pro progressivity isn't. So, um, so according to Friedman, uh, Mises stood up, stomped his foot and said, you're all a bunch of socialists and, and stomped out of the room. And so, you know, that, that did, something like that did happen, but the way he told it was with some, like a little bit too much relish for, for, for Murray to, to, to take. Well, he said some other things which I don't remember because I think, uh, uh, well, uh, was, that means was intolerant. But uh, Henry Hazard came up to me afterwards. Why he came up to me, I don't know. And he said, Friedman lied. And I was, I was taken oh. back by uh, what, oh. what Hazard said, because I guess he was at the meeting. And um, it just showed you that uh, sometimes interpersonal relationships in academia are, are not uh, copacetic, to say the least. <laughs> but he came over, and he, he, he looked visibly upset that Friedman said what he did. And I'll never forget that, because why he picked me out to say that, I don't know. But uh, it was just kind of interesting that he said that. Well, to give a little more context on, on Friedman, he was very engaging to the students. He came around, he took an interest in us, he wanted to know what schools we were going to, what had attracted us to Austrian economics. Uh, same is true of uh, Hazlitt. He really engaged. I mean, we were uh, wet behind the ears, graduate students, and here were these distinguished gentlemen really taking an interest in us. Uh, the statement by Friedman that, that upset me, the, the, that just seemed odd to me that he would deny at an Austrian conference that there were, but the statement that upset me is that he said that Mises had great integrity, but that some of his followers did not. And that seemed to me to be directed at Murray. And I didn't know this background, but uh, it, it it bothered me that Friedman would make would cast a uh, an aspersion like that at at Murray at this conference. Yeah, it does seem a little odd to be sort of crashing someone else's party. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I will say, in Friedman's defense, some of these uh, folks, uh, you know, back then they were they, they were they were not a, at that time they were not as polished and diplomatic as they are now, like Walter, for example. But like Walter is now. <laughs> But I mean, more than one of the reminiscences suggest that uh, apparently Milton Friedman's son David, at a at a previous meeting, a meeting of the Philadelphia Society, had said of his father Milton that Milton had fascist tendencies or fascist <laughs> sympathies, and apparently some of you asked Friedman about this <laughs> on Friday night, and he gave a sort of a grumpy kind of a response. But I, I will say Fr Friedman might have mellowed a little bit because uh, sometime in the early 90s when the, uh, uh, the Mises uh, Summer Conference was being held at Stanford University, I was a student, graduate student at that time, and not myself, but another group of graduate students on walking from the dorm to the place where the sessions were held had bumped into Friedman, who was at the Hoover Institution at Stanford at that time, and apparently told him, hey, we're at the Mises Institute Summer Conference. Murray Rothbard is giving the keynote speech. Would you like to come and hear it? And Friedman just sort of laughed, or uh, he made some kind of a polite, he, he didn't bite their heads off, but he just sort of laughed like, no, I don't think that's for me, and kind of walked off. So, um, okay, let's turn back to the substance of the conference for a moment. Um, as I think most of you know, the, the, the keynote, the main lectures were subsequently published in the book edited by Dolan, uh, which I'm, I think you can buy downstairs, called the, it's the Foundations of Modern Austrian Economics, right? Which for many of us was, you know, sort of a, uh, one of the most important uh, early books that we read, sort of summarizing the modern Austrian uh, uh, tradition. But do you remember, what were your impressions of the, the, the substance of the lectures? I mean, were, were, were Rothbard, Kirzner, and Lachman, were they good speakers? Were they easy to understand? Were you thinking, oh gosh, I'm starstruck, there's my hero up there? Or were you like taking notes, thinking, oh, that's an important point. You know, I need to remember that for my dissertation. Talk about what you remember of the lectures themselves, um, Jack. I remember both Rothbard and Kirzner being very easy to understand, lucid. Now, realize I spent <clears throat> four years sitting in classrooms, never heard a lecture on Austrian economics. This was a thrill 
to me. It was, uh, I mean, it was like uh, drinking uh, from a fountain when you're, when you're in the desert. They were just, they, it was a fabulous experience for me that way. Lockman was a different story. And is there anyone in here who has seen uh, videos? As I don't know if it, uh, he... You've got to see this guy to believe the way he speaks. And he came out... Now, this room, it's a big L-shaped room. I'm sitting maybe 10 feet from Lockman, right in the front row, not far from him. He comes out and opens his mouth, and it's all I can do to keep from laughing. And, I mean... It, it's a terrible, and, and, and what's worse, way back in the back of the room, so you can't see way back in the back of the L, there's Murray back there, just cackling like hell. I mean, <laughs> and it's embarrassing. So I'm embarrassed, I'm trying to keep from laughing. I don't think I understood a word that, that Lockman, I mean, the, the, this the delivery went right by me. Now, I later really came to appreciate Lachman. He was a great gentleman, a great scholar. I studied under him at NYU. I, have, I had the most respect for him. But I have to say that first, that first encounter was one of the most painful things that I've sat through <laughs> trying to sit there looking intelligent while he's... Yeah. Anyone else have a different impression? Or <laughs> Uh, I, I sat pretty close to Lachman when he was speaking, and the thing that I noticed immediately is that those of you that remember old photogra uh, phonographs, 78 RPMs, uh, 45 and 33, Lachman was speaking no more than 16 RPM. <laughs> I mean, it was really slow and deliberate. And uh, Rothbard. Sorry, had, can I translate that to the younger crowd? Yeah. It's like on YouTube, you put it to like 0 0.5x <laughs> on the playback. <laughs> Sorry, please continue. And uh, I'm, I'm watching him turn over his uh, papers and giving his talk. And Rothbard has such depth and breadth of the topic. And you can see that in the book with all the footnotes. And I was just blown away by his knowledge of uh, the prehistory of the Austrian school. Lachman's paper was, I think, five pages long. And it took him an hour to read it. It, 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 it was really incredible. And... Um, I don't remember the substance of it. I had to go back and read it in the, in the book. I think it was Capital and the Structure. But I think oh, that was the title of his book. But um, he was so slow and deliberate. And um, I, I wasn't um, amused by it. I, I just felt uh, he was, re I don't know if he had a medical condition or what, but, <laughs> but it was really slow. And I didn't know Jack, I didn't know Jack was, uh, was uh, having that um, giggly's moment in, in, uh, in the room there. But... Um, yeah, that's what I remember about Lachman. It was really slow. Kersner was right on point, uh, and uh, a lot of substance, as I recall. And for so and me, who was a newbie, this was, this was like getting a, a semester's worth of economics in one week. And to me, that was uh, a highlight of my academic career, because I never had so much substance delivered in one week. And, um, and since then, I, I've been uh, running with the uh, ideas that were there to explain how the world works. Right. Well, yeah, I, I would say uh, I just echo what what both of these guys said. That uh, I mean, um, Rothbard, very engaging speaker. Kersner was great. I couldn't understand anything Lachman said. We were talking over the dinner the other night. I think you know uh, because I because I read the book afterwards. It's been a while since yeah. I've looked at it. You know, and, and I could understand what was in the book. I said, is that an actual transcript of what, what he said? Because when he was saying it, I couldn't understand a thing. Good. Walter's now eager to defend his uh, recommendation of Lachman to Kirsten. Uh, he was very spirited. My uh, favorite expression of his is, V must smash Zem. Um, there were differences between the three of them. For example, Lachman not only didn't believe uh, in equilibrium as a theoretical construct, he didn't believe it at all. I mean, most uh, mainstream live or die by equilibrium. Austrians, I think, to the main degree, at least uh, believe we're moving in that direction. We never reach it, but uh, because something else is always going to change. But at least it's a... Uh, a, a reasonable construct, whereas he just rejected it entirely. 
Uh, and then there were differences between Murray and Israel. Uh, Israel was always talking about entrepreneurship, about seeking pure profit. And Murray was saying, but entrepreneurs sometimes get losses, had, had a losses figure in, and Israel had no response in, in my view. So of the three, I was certainly much more um, uh, uh, agreeing with Murray Rothbard than with the other two. So could, could some of you talk a little bit about how attendance at this event uh, changed your professional trajectory in terms of what you chose to study or write about afterward? And, and you know, to what extent was the conference itself responsible as opposed to just other Austrian works that you began to read? Any, any thoughts on, especially those of you who are still working on dissertations at that time, which I guess is everybody up here but, but Walter. Yeah, I finished my uh, degree in 1972. I just want to mention one thing, one bit of advice on that. At Columbia, where I got my PhD, in order to defend your dissertation, which is the most important thing, because a lot of people get out with an ABD, they never all but dissertation. Um, at Columbia, you needed three people from the economics department, one person, a uh, professor from Columbia, but not in the economics department, and a total outsider. So I picked three guys from economics, and then I picked this guy from the business school who seemed nice, and he said, oh, uh, my dissertation was on rent control. He said, well, I know somebody who's interested in rent control. Shall I invite him? And I said, sure. This guy was a, a rent control commissioner. <laughs> and it, it took two hours for me to defend the dissertation, and then for three hours they were just sitting there arguing as to whether I would pass or not. And if I didn't pass, I'd have to another year and a half, two years. So my advice to you young people who are getting your PhDs, pack that, that department. <laughs> Don't be picking a, a rent control commissioner if you're, <laughs> if you're writing on, 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 on rent control. And you have the power, at least I did at Columbia, to pick whoever I wanted. So my advice to you is to pick any of the professors at the Mises Institute as, as your fifth uh, person. Yeah, you never know which one of us might be moonlighting as a rent control commissioner. <laughs> but uh, well, one thing I'll say about talk about uh, your, uh, yeah, your career well, one trajectory. thing uh, uh, I'll say about the conference is uh, you know g g reading the Austrians sort of on your own and everything. When that conference was held, you saw, hey, actually, there's a community of people who have similar ideas, and that conference and the follow-on conferences help to build a community of, uh, of people. Um, and, and, it's, and it's lasted and built. I mean, you know, here, you know, there's still a, a community of people stemming from that 1974 meeting. Uh, and uh, I mean, my own career, uh, uh, I did, I've done a lot of public choice stuff and not strictly uh, Austrian stuff, but at the same time, I, I was a faculty member here at Auburn when the Mises Institute was founded. Uh, and Roger Garrison was here. He's somebody that that I had met at the at, at the conference, and so uh, I think the network that started in 1974 has pretty long legs. Yeah, how important was that for all of you to know that there was this community beyond the people that you were already in with your classmates? Or uh, it, it was very important. Um, it was very inspirational. First, it was very inspiring to see three great scholars and the way they went about presenting their ideas. Um, but, but beyond that, the interaction between all of us, seeing that there were other people out there. Now, I've told the story before, but um, about two years before that, when I started reading Austrian economics, I was working as a janitor. Um, and I um, would finish my work very, very quickly. And so by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I would go into the broom closet under a naked yellow bulb, and I'd be reading America's Great Depression. And, and at the end of the summer, I came out of that closet. I, I came out of the closet as an Austrian. But, 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 but still, I felt so alone. I was alone. I was in a closet. For me, uh, 
74 was uh, a transformative year because I had to really get up to speed on the literature of the economics of inflation. There was nothing on the geography of inflation. In fact, um, I just kept on reading every case study I could. Uh, uh, Bresciani Tironi about the German hyperinflation. There was a book on the Chinese hyperinflation and all these wonderful uh, case studies. And for the students who may not know, 1974 was a very high inflationary year. It was the, it was the highest inflation we had since uh, World War II. And, um, and so I was interested not only in current events, but how did we get here? And then I was looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Price Index to see exactly how inflation impacted local communities differently because the national CPI that we get every month is an aggregate of local CPIs. So, this, so that meant that CPIs were different according to region. And my thesis was because of the Fed's monetary policy, money enters the system and diffuses through. And where, where does the money begin to diffuse from? The major city banks. And so therefore we would expect the hypothesis that the inflation rate would be higher in large cities than smaller cities. And that's what the data te tended to show. In fact, uh, right now it shows a little bit differently because of the South being a recipient of a lot of money coming in from other parts of the country. And so I just kept on reading and reading. And eventually, I got a job as a staff economist at the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, and then worked for their investment subsidiary in the investment services. And eventually, I got my job at Ramapo teaching finance on an emergency basis because there was an opening. And so I was at the right place at the right time in the late 70s, learning about inflation, monetary policy, uh, 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 government spending, whatever whatever, and I was using those skills to become a staff economist, even though I didn't have a degree in economics, not only not a PhD in economics, but not even an undergraduate degree in economics. So, I, so the lesson for my students was keep on learning. You don't have to have a degree in a specialty to, to uh, get a job in an area that you enjoy. And that is basically a why that conference was so important in my academic and personal career, professional career, because without that knowledge, there's no way I would have, got a, uh, would have gotten a job as a finance professor at Ramapo in 1985. And uh, the way it worked out is I had three emergency appointments, and they liked me there, and I got a tenure-track position. And as they say, the rest is history. So uh, the, the real success of my career, if you want to me measure that, really began in 1974 at this conference. So uh, needless to say, I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to Murray, to Joe, for, for his ability to uh, uh, get information to me that I requested. And uh, uh, it was just an incredible, incredible experience how one event can change your life so dramatically. Uh, for me, I was just about to start UCLA. I hadn't been. And uh, UCLA students showed up at that conference. I made friends with them. They were big help to me when I got to UCLA. I also met at that conference Don LaVoy. Now, Don died young. He died 50 from cancer. But <clears throat> he and I later became colleagues at the Market Process the Mercatus Center at uh, George Mason University. Uh, David Henderson and Harry Watson, I became lifelong friends with them. I met them at the South Royalton Conference. I mean, it's like, now I didn't study in a closet, Joe, but it, <laughs> it, it really, uh, that was the significance of that conference to me, um, uh, professionally and personally, all the friends I made. The other significance, and um, I think this is still true today, I made contacts there, so, so the rest of my graduate work, work was supported by charitable contributions. That <clears throat> conference was my uh, first experience of that. I met George Pearson from, the, from IHS. Yeah, Ken Templeton, and those uh, those foundations supported my graduate work and, and research during the early part of my career. I think Austrian economics exists today. This movement exists today because of the, uh, those nonprofit activities. And uh, South Royalton, I think, for Austrian economics was the beginning of that. 
Now, I think one thing you're picking up here you know, is the importance of community. Now, all of our panelists, we have three who are in the New York, greater New York area, and we're able to h hang out at Libertarian or Austrian events there. And I guess, Randy and Jack, you were both uh, at Virginia Tech at that time, which had several students interested in these ideas. And Jack, you went on to UCLA. I mean, I, I think if we had some other participants here who were not in any of those networks, like Roger Garrison, who I think was at uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, where he was the only, you know, Austrian uh, inclined person. Suda Shinoi was in Australia. Of course, her father was friendly with Hayek, so she had family connections to this sort of broader movement. Yeah, but right. there must have been many other participants, too, who, who really were the only you know, Austrian inclined person in their in their circles. Yeah, R Roger was a student at University of Virginia at the time in the PhD program, and Larry Moss was there also, and at the time he was an assistant professor at University of Virginia. Yeah, okay, before. so there were some other connections too, but I, mean, I guess the point is for those of you earlier in your careers now, you know, the relationships that you make, not only at face-to-face -face events like this, but also through other kinds of networking that you can do online are obviously hugely important uh, for one's career. I want to talk about one other participant that was there and was actually very inspirational because he was really the, f his name was Dom Armentano. He wrote the really the first book among our generation um, uh, and it was in a p applied, he applied Austrian economics to um, uh, industrial organization to, and it was called The Myths, the Myths of Antitrust. And it, it was, uh, he was probably five, six years older than, than the rest of us. But, um, he, because he was he was younger and he was the first one to write a book, you know, after Kersner had and, and Rothbard and so on. Um, I, I think he, he well he certainly inspired me personally to be more productive to to to, to want to write more because um, Rothbard pr highly praised the book, and so you know you wanted you sort of wanted to be noticed in your master's eye, and so I think that was very inspirational. Great. We want to give uh, you guys a chance to participate in this conversation as well. So if you have a question that you would like to address to a specific panelist or the panel as a whole, please raise your hand. And we don't have an audience mic, so be sure and speak loudly, Professor Holzman, which I know you can do. Yes, yeah, I was to stand up. Joseph said was once a closet Austrian. My question was the number of participants. How many people? Yeah. It was about 50, right? 30. No, no, no. 50. According to the roster. Yeah, according to the roster, there were 50. Yeah. And yeah. speakers? Well, so if I understand correctly, yeah. I mean, there were th only the three formal speakers, Rothbard, Kersner, and Lockman. But then there were what they called informal, well, there's Hazlitt, but during the afternoons, if you look at the schedule downstairs, they called them like informal presentation breakouts. And it looks like uh, maybe Rizzo or O'Driscoll presented something. Uh, Driscoll and Chinoy, but there were three or four. Do you, do you guys have any recollection of those informal student presentations? I don't even remember O'Driscoll oh, and Chinoy. I know, I know they did one. I don't think I attended it. And I don't, I don't think there were any others. Were there? Do you remember? Yeah, uh, I don't if remember, but present. I do remember Larry Moss doing magic tricks. Oh, yeah. He and, and I mean... <laughs> I, I, I can't, he is a professional ma a magician, so it was just spectacular, <laughs> the magic tricks yeah, yeah. that he did. If, if you read the written accounts, there are a lot of stories, we haven't gotten into this, about the, the, the physical infrastructure. Wow. This small town in the middle of nowhere, apparently it was completely dead, the housing was not so good, the conference was at a, a broken down, run down hotel, and w one of the stories said that uh, it was raining, and a bunch of you guys were like hanging out with Murray Rothbard late into the night giggling. And uh, uh, W.H. Hutt came out in his pajamas yeah. and, and apparently with a nightcap on like a character from a, from a Dickens novel and said that uh, the roof was leaking in, onto his bed. <laughs> so. yeah, but, no, uh, I, re I remember Hutt, I remember Hutt coming down and, and, and distressed and uh, this is the worst venue for a conference that I have ever attended <laughs> in my life. It was just god awful. You couldn't call it a small town. I think it was a ghost town that had been abandoned, right? I mean, you could actually hear wolves or coyotes baying. At, at, and, and the people in the town, if you saw the, um, the, the movie... Um, Deliverance. 
no, the pod people. <laughs> where, where there's invaders that take people's bodies over. It, it was a famous movie in the 50s and it was remade. Invasion of body snatch. The people, when they were walking down the streets, they just had a strange, they just looked off. They never looked in the eye. They just looked off to this very strange look in their eye. These well, mountain people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, well, from some of the accounts, apparently you were housed in, like, people's houses that were, like, abandoned houses or empty houses. House. We were in a house, uh, uh, I don't know, a few hundred feet away from the main building, and... Um, a regular family lived down there. Yeah, it, it, we, lived, we uh, stayed upstairs, and uh, we didn't stay there much, just to sleep, I guess, and uh, we were at the uh, main building for, the, for most but of the day. They never, said a, they, ne they never said a word to us. We'd come in, they'd be watching television, they'd look, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and we'd look, and we'd run up the stairs. <laughs> yeah. You made sure you locked your door for, yeah, before you went to sleep. You know, Murray, Murray was a night person. I learned this. Oh, okay. at this. So, the, uh, so he's up till all hours, kind of holding court, laughing. And he get, uh, along about midnight, he gets hungry. He said, ah, oh, let's go get something to eat. Well, there was one little store in town. Uh, we walk over to that. Of course, it's closed. He sends us around to try the back door. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is Mr. Property Rights. We're going, we're going in the back door. Uh, it was closed, and so we went rummaging around the dorms, and he found, uh, like, some ham and cheese and so in one of the fridges. <laughs> and I said to him, Murray, what about property rights? And he said, property rights? Pro uh, uh, of course, he replaced it the next day, but um, it, it, it must have been hell for Murray to be in South Royalton, Vermont. Yeah, imagine a lifelong New Yorker <laughs> being in this little <laughs> town. Oh, yeah, uh, Bob Betamarker. Do you want to tell why you were in such facilities? Are they not some sort of interesting questions? I mean... Yeah, I know the answer to it. You know, I was talking about the thought, basically. I don't know. Well, maybe you could tell the story. I've yeah. always been why? curious. Yeah, why was we supposed there? to have a conference at Dartmouth? Yeah. And everything oh. was set up, and all of a sudden, some other professors there, who are these, these Austrians? We don't want them coming around. And they oh. canceled. Isn't that? No. I, mean, I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, I had heard that. I'm not sure where from. Well, if they don't teach, if they didn't teach Austria, you could. Overcame that, right? That the movement mm. overcame that. And that's your, your inspiration. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I thought most economists didn't understand or heard of the Austrian schools at that time. So well, why would they object to it? I, they, uh, that, that's the point. But unless they heard what they heard, they maybe yeah. I don't know. Uh, maybe yeah. somebody it could have been as few as one person that, that did that. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, he's but, the rest. Who does? Yeah. Uh, that it was. Yeah. So uh, just to clarify, and thanks to Susie for put our archivist for putting together these materials. Again, if you haven't looked downstairs, there's a binder, and maybe some of you guys should have looked too. There's a <laughs> there's a binder that has copies of the original program, right, I saw that. and the reading list, and also uh, uh, several articles that have been written over the years. Uh, looking back at the event, but, you know, it's interesting. You know, adversity builds uh, resilience, and uh, you know, kind of maybe a foxhole experience of being in this less than less than desirable location was good for the movement. So I look around at this beautiful facility here and the nice accommodations in Auburn, and I think you guys are soft. So <laughs> we, we need a little more adversity to build some more modern Austrian community. Yes, I, I wondered about the, the the organizing force. I understand it was IHS, right? And, and so does that mean the Koch brothers or? Not that. Yes. They were? It was, it was them. Yes, it was. He had just, I think, taken over IHS at the time. In 74? I, yeah. so. I think that's where the money came from. The documents suggest that, yeah, IHS was um, kind of a broker institution, was yeah. getting funding from, the, from Charles Koch, yeah. but also probably from the Earhart Foundation and Lilly that's, Foundation, that's, SCAFE, some of the other organizations that were promoting free market scholarship in that That's in when that they were time. the good cokes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Joe may know, or some of these people may, may know, but I mean, I was just a student showing up, you know, hey, this looks like an interesting conference and where the money came from. Yeah, I, I had no idea. Yeah, I didn't know that. But uh, according to the letter from Ed Dolan to the participants, it doesn't look like there was a lot of money to go around because uh, some of you had to pay for your own transportation, I guess. 
The letter said room and board are provided. Right. You should, but but the, there's a letter saying we've run out of money to pay for travel costs. That's so. why I took a train. Tom. I had the Lockwood story. Uh, when I was in uh, graduate school at Virginia Tech, it was called Virginia Polytechnic Institute and I moved to 1976. Uh, Richard Wagner ran the lecture series for the economics department that he read at Lockwood. And uh, it was, uh, Jack's story about uh, he was laughing, there was about 30 or so of us graduate students sitting in the back. And we had the same reaction as Jack did. We just couldn't, it was hurry. Couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> we didn't say one word that he said none of that. But his way of talking, he was very slow, but at the end of every word, he was drowned. You had time, you were making fun, man. Other questions? Yeah, Jonathan. Uh, so you mentioned uh, not to take for granted uh, the Mises Institute, the resources we have here. I wonder if the panelists could comment on uh, what they see as like modern manifestations or modern versions of, of that conference, uh, things offered by the Institute, perhaps. Yeah, what sort of programs today are maybe performing a similar role, although the circumstances are obviously different? The fortunes of the Austrian school are obviously much better now than they were back then. Well, I think what's going on here at the Mises Institute, you know, is um, that's carrying on what started in South Royalton. Uh, also, there's a Society for Development of Austrian Economics. It meets concurrent with the Southern Economic Association. So it's really a pretty big network today, unlike, I mean, before South Royalton, there was no network. Uh, so, uh, you know, these, th that's a, the, a kind of legacy there, but I don't know that there's anything that's comparable because the Austrian movement is so much better organized now. Yeah, and also, you know, Jonathan, it's a cliche, I guess, for older people to talk about life before the internet. <laughs> but I mean, it really was different. You, you, you just couldn't get access to materials unless you were close to a university library. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you know, now you can, you can binge read the entire, you know, every issue of the Libertarian Forum, you know, in one afternoon. But back then, you know, it came once a month and you ran to the mailbox, you know, to get it. You devoured it in a few pages and it was over. And then, you know, you had to wait till the next month. So back in the closet, <laughs> yeah, back in the closet. exactly. <laughs> uh, Peter, I, I wanted to put in a good word for Ludwig uh, Lachmann. Uh, this is Asia. It, in terms of organizing movement, Israel Kirzner was a zero. He just wasn't interested in it. He was a scholar and that was it. Murray, a little bit, but Ludwig was much more spirited than anyone else in terms of developing interaction with people. So I think we owe him some sort of credit. Yes, he was hard to understand. You had to know him a little bit and get used to him, but still, we owe him a debt. Yeah, I want to mention that there was a significant correspondence between Ludwig Lachman and Murray during the night during the 1950s. Uh, we we found that in the archives. Uh, Patrick Newman and I in, in in writing our book on Rothbard. Yeah, another connection is that uh, you know Lachman spent much of his professional career in South Africa, Johannesburg, but a uh, hut was in Cape Town, and uh, there were uh, Kirzner, of course, grew up in South Africa. So I mean, there, there were there were some connections, other international connections, people who knew each other, and you know, some of them maybe going back to the Mont Pelerin Society from the 1940s and 50s. So I mean, there was a, a kind of a network of free market oriented folks, but it was very scattered. It wasn't focused on Austrian economics, uh, but but you know, these those personal connections really make a big difference. Uh, Lachman, uh, of all the Austrian professors that I've had, he was the most strategically oriented. He really thought a lot about how Austrians should try to talk to the profession, to other economists, to policymakers. Uh, although uh, I, he, he had us, I attended his macroeconomics class at NYU during my year there. And uh, he was very favorably disposed to a lot of aspects of John Maynard Keynes. 
And he made us read Keynes. He made us think about Keynes. He made us discuss Keynes. I, I can see why Hutt would be so upset with him, but it was a part of his scholarly intellectual outlook. He also introduced uh, me to, to George Shackle, who's a very interesting, uh, I would say, Austrian-oriented economist, a, a man whose work is still worth studying today. So uh, I, I have great respect, and, uh, despite the fact that uh, he was responsible for a very painful uh, lecture. Uh, uh, <laughs> I have great uh, admiration for Ludwig Lachmann. Stephen? Um, I was just remembering that uh, Mises died the year before this conference. Right, right. So I was just curious about that. I, I mean, I guess you, guys, you all knew that. Mm -hmm. the time and the significance of Mises to the school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could I actually add to that? I mean, Karen Vaughan in her account suggests that Mises passing sort of opened things up a little bit. She says that during Mises' day, you know, there was too much, this is her interpretation, there was too much sort of deference to the master, but that since he had passed, people felt more free to speak about disagreements they might have had with Mises. Did any of you have that impression at the conference? Murray's chapter nine in Man, Economy, and State was, was a critique of Mises, and this was long before Mises died, so I think that that's problematic. Yeah, yeah, and Mises retired in 1969, didn't write much since his book in 1962, and Rothbard was very open to, to forming a movement uh, of all Austrians, so I, 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 I would disagree with her interpretation. Fernando? Uh, I, I, would oh, yeah, also, I, I would also say that from the, the beginnings of my interactions with Austrian economists, uh, these are people who love to argue. And uh, <laughs> there has, I, I have never felt quashed or um, like I shouldn't say something or that, that uh, I was going to be uh, somehow run out of town on a rail. No, debate, debate, disagreement, and I see it here. I see it uh, in the, uh, the papers that are, that are given here. No, it's a, it's a great part of the Austrian tradition is our freedom to disagree with one another. Thank you. Fernando. So I think it's a complimentary question to you. Uh, what about Hayek? What did you guys, did you guys didn't talk about him in, in the conference, and why was he not there? Yeah, just as an aside, he was invited according to the documents, oh. but was not able to attend for health reasons. Oh. Well, he attended the next year. Yeah, he yeah. went to the one in Hartford. Yeah, he was at the one in, in Hartford. After he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, yeah, after he won the Nobel Prize, so that was the pretty, uh, pretty, pretty big event for, for a student like me, you know, the no, Nobel laureate uh, Hayek. Uh, shows up as a department. When he got there, and you were like, "Wow, now there's a like symbol." Like, yeah, and, and it was oh, this is work. It was more than just seeing him. I mean, he was there the whole week. Yeah. I mean, it was a week long yeah, conference, and he was there and participating the whole week. Yeah, I gave my first academic paper that the first the next year after South Rolton at the Hartford conference, and. Um, Hayek was one, was one of the ones that commented on it because they had the senior scholars commenting on junior scholars' paper. And I had written about international monetary theory, and I cited his work from 1937, which I think is one of his greatest books ever, even though it's like 99 pages. It's, it's a wonderful book. And um, when he got up, he says, I've forgotten I made a contribution in this area. He didn't even remember, he didn't remember the book. I, I, I have to brag yeah. again. I, I beat Hayek in chess. Now, the way I win is I grab, I say, look over there, and I grab the guy's queen. Uh, I wrote. A, a in fairness, thing, Hayek was 76 years old at that yeah, time. Yeah. This was at the Windsor Castle. Um, oh, yeah, okay, so 77, maybe. I, I don't remember. Um, I regard him as an excellent economist, but as a libertarian, not as rabid as I would like. I wrote a, a, a critique of his Road to Serfdom, and then Milton Friedman, who had blackballed him for getting a, a position in the economics department at Chicago. He got a position at Chicago, but it was in the, what was it? Committee, Committee of Social Thought, but not economics. Uh, Friedman and I had a back and forth for five or six uh, iterations, and he was defending Hayek uh, 
because Friedman is not much better of a libertarian than Hayek. Uh, I think, okay, uh, yeah, right here and then. So, can I have two questions? We could have a Grove City College student. Was Hans Senholz there? And then number two, how much of objectivist philosophy was at the South Carolina Conference? Senholz was not, was not present. I don't know if he was invited. Yeah, I don't remember anything objectivist. I mean, um, uh, you're asking old people to remember something 50 years ago. <laughs> but, but pretty much what I remember is Rothbard talking about his work, Kersner talking about his work, Lachlan talking about his work. So it's the stuff that was already in the body of Austrian economics, and they're just passing it's lectures based on their earlier work. Uh, I have an anecdote to tell about that. Uh, one time... Um, Ayn Rand's lieutenants were criticizing Mises for not being Randian enough. And Rand was very nice, said, leave him alone. He's done a great work. He's made a great contribution. So I support Ayn Rand on that. I, I know you mentioned uh, Friedman at the first in San Rosa, but were there any other uh, outsiders that came in and tried to like argue, or maybe in the first one or at their future conferences? Anything Now, just as a follow-up, I don't think uh, people uh, know this, or maybe they do, that in October of that year, there was a Libertarian Scholars Conference uh, organized for New York City. Remember? And uh, Walter, I remember, was one of the key speakers. And there were some left-wingers who attended. And Walter criticized some of these left-wingers. And one of the left-wingers got out and was very upset that Walter criticized him. So it shows you where that um, open discourse is not liked very much by the left. Uh, we can take it, they can't. <laughs> you know, one thing to keep in mind, when, if you look at the histories of, these, of this time and the accounts of these several conferences that we're talking about, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, when, when, when you look at a distinguished crowd like this, there's a little bit of what you know, uh, statisticians would call sampling on the dependent variable meaning we only have examples here of people who have been great successes and made great contributions to the Austrian school, you will also, especially as you get to 75, 76, 77, see the names of some conference, conference participants that you don't recognize, people who never uh, went into academia or public life. Um, they may have benefited personally from attending the conference, but it's not the case that the organizers were able to pick all of the, you know, correctly anticipate in an entrepreneurial sense who would end up being the major contributors to the modern Austrian school. A lot of you guys were there, and at least some of that is probably, you know, the, the, has to do with the impact of being part of that community. But it's not the case that everyone who was invited turned out, out to be a household name in our circles. I mean, that's a great observation. Um, but, at, you know, for most of us, we were graduate students, so how do you know how people are going to turn out. But you look at the list of people who were there, there's a lot of people who had a big impact on economics subsequently. So, I mean, it yeah. actually, you know, maybe it was the influence of the conference or good choices of who was invited, but there's a lot of people who went on to make big contributions in yeah. economics. I guess what I'm thinking in response to your question, like for the Hartford and the Windsor Castle Conference, there's some names of people who maybe we, we don't know how sympathetic they were, but maybe they went in a different direction mm -hmm. later. So I wanted to mention another person who's part of the history of our movement. That's Carl Hess. Carl Hess was the uh, speechwriter for um, Goldwater. And uh, at that time, he was an extreme right winger. And then he moved left, I guess, to libertarianism. And then he moved further left and became a, a new leftist and, and try to uh, bring leftism in. And I was critical of that. Yeah. John Blundell says that Roy Childs showed up at the Windsor Castle Conference without an invitation. He just showed up and he was sleeping in his car. And... It was at Hartford. Hartford. Oh, at Hartford. Hartford. Okay. He didn't drive to <laughs> That's true. Good point. Okay. Thank you for that correction. See, geography is important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I have a very final question, but obviously uh, I knew the most part of the uh, member of Mises School, and uh, I know that Weigel was and uh, Riesner was. Kirchner uh, was as well. Right? How many other, was Israel Kirchner part of Mises' seminar as well? And how many other? Yeah, he was his assistant. 
He was his, his graduate, means his graduate assistant. Oh. Person. Was there anybody else besides uh, Tetzman and the Rock? Hazlitt showed up. Hazlitt would attend the seminar. Larry Fertig was a, a sort of a, a labor. Uh, a labor lawyer, but on the right side, on the other side. <laughs> Larry Moss, although he attended Columbia, I think Larry Moss attended the, the Mises Seminar. Oh, you're talking about New York University? Yeah, I think Larry Moss was part of that. And so did Karen Vaughan. Yeah, Karen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Percy Greaves, Percy uh, Graves. Bettina Graves. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Bettina. Yeah. Bill Peterson. Yeah. Mm. Please. Hey, you mentioned that. Um, before this conference, the outer group was scattered, right? It was in shambles. And I am curious because in the 40s and 30s and 20s, where Mises and I had all these institutions, they had the separate business, separate research. Uh, there was a lot of society, for example. Uh, why, why is it that the movement fractured? They had all these institutions before, but then it, somewhere around the 40s, 50s, 60s, it just broke apart. Then it was broke apart in the 70s. Why, why did it fracture? Well, you've got a theory on this, Joe Salerno. Well, it didn't it didn't fracture. I mean, people left Austria during the 30s because of of, of Hitler, of, of the Anschluss or the coming uh, um, events that they foresaw. And so many of the Austrian economists that came to the United States, such as Fritz Machler, uh, Gottfried Hobler, all, all students of Mises or at least members of his private seminar, um, wanted to get jobs. And Austrian economics at that point by, by the mid to late 30s was beginning to, to, to lose its whatever influence that it had had and accumulate a lot of influence. So, um, and then Mises left um, in 34, right. right? Yeah, and Hayek had left in 31. And so it was really a, a, an Austrian diaspora. They, they dispersed and, and it just broke, broke up the, yeah. the movement, the, the network. Yeah, but yeah. you also have a, a more doctrinal interpretation too, right? That you know, price theory was underdeveloped, and in the 1920s, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, 1930s, well, also, the, the right, seeds but, of the right. decline were already there. Right. right. So, so Alfred Marshall and partial equilibrium, the Alfred Marshall approach, the British approach to price theory, and the Valrasian approach, the continental European approach, um, sort of began to dominate in the 1930s. And the Austrians weren't a, weren't a, a, a group that was together. And, and so the, the, the Austrian price theory never developed. And that's the core of economics. And, and I think it's, that, that's one of the reasons why it's di it died. Not because of the Keynesian Revolution. It was already dying in the, in the early 30s. Jack, would, would you, were you want to well, go? Well, I was just going to say uh, that uh, this book uh, on the marginal revolutionaries is quite good on the, the, the social uh, and professional interactions of the Austrian economics in Austria. That is, the origins of the school, what happened after the First World War, which was a real blow to the Austrians and the Austrians, the loss of that empire. They had a lot of influence in the empire. And then uh, the rise of Nazism, Hitler, the dispersal of the school to the United well, which States. Book, which book are you talking about? The, uh, Mar it's called like the Mar or, or no, no, the, Mar the, the book, it's a newer book, The Marginal Revolutionaries oh. by Yannick Wasserman. Now, this book has some real f flaws, and in particular, no one in this room will like the ending of that book where he just basically casts dispersions at the Mises Institute. But there are parts of that book that are very well done, very well researched, and, and worth reading if you want to understand the history of the Austrian school as a school, not, not the doctrine. He, this guy doesn't understand economic theory well, <laughs> but he, he understands the school as a school. This is another job for David Gordon. <laughs> Guido, David's Guido, already reviewed that minutes. book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I noticed that uh, John Blondell was, uh, was part of the initial How many other foreigners who got how did this change over the next few years? Mm -hmm. Waddell? No. Well, Suda Shinoy? Yeah. And Suda. Yeah. Not very Suda many, Shinoy, I think. Yeah. Who was from Australia. Mm -hmm. How did she know about Conference? Yeah. Well, I mean, her father was taught by Hayek, and she, she, she had some connect. I think she had oh, scores on with Murray. Must have been, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, he was, IHS. I think Mundell was working for IHS, IHS at that yeah. time. Last question. I've heard some names associated with, with FEE, but apparently they weren't, they probably weren't at this conference. So I'm curious, what was the interaction between this budding academic movement and the folks over at FEE? That's an interesting question. Did you guys participate in fee events at that time? Uh, the year I spent se uh, the year 76, 77 at uh, New York University, and uh, uh, I think it was Richard Ebeling. Anyway, someone took me up to fee where I met Percy Graves, Bettina Graves. They were very active, very supportive of the Austrian movement in at yeah. New York University, but. Um, uh, you know, we didn't interact much with them, and I don't think they uh, supported uh, financially or otherwise the program at New York University. Interesting. All right. I, th I think both Mises and Hayek were at least advisors to FEE, maybe even on their, their board when, when it started. Yep. I think Israel Kirsten was on their board as well. Yeah. Yeah, and, and FEE published that rent control pamphlet by Friedman and Stigler that was influential to some yeah, of you, right? That's true. So, well, thank you all very much, and thanks to our panelists for their reminiscence.